So last week we got into the darker side of Paul the Apostle where he consented to Stephen's death and participated in the stoning of Stephen and began to persecute the church and cause all kind of problems. And this week we're going to get into the experience that Paul had with Jesus on the Damascus Road. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 9 verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So this is what we call the Damascus Road experience. Paul had this incredible encounter with Jesus, and I really believe that he would not have come to God any other way because he was so adverse to this movement. And uh, it, it took this type of experience to just break down that hard heart and get him to see Jesus for who he really was. Many people since then have had similar types of experiences with God where God has revealed Himself. Now, it may not have been just like this, but powerful experiences through a dream, through a vision, you know, encountering God in a way that just opens their eyes. Um, I've often prayed for people in my lifetime, family or friends, that, you know, have a really hard heart and they're far away from God. And I say, God, just give them a Damascus Road experience where they just, you know, forces them basically to see the light of the gospel. And that's what happened for Paul. He encountered Jesus in such a way, there was no way that he could deny it, and it immediately changed him forever. There are three things that I want you to notice from this story. First of all, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul would have never thought that he was persecuting the Son of God. He, he never would have you know, realized that. He thought he was persecuting people, that were opposed to God and opposed to Judaism, he never would have thought that he was persecuting the Son of God, but he was. And notice how Jesus takes that persecution personally. He says, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul never laid a finger on Jesus himself, but by persecuting his children, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? It's the same thing today. When you read about Christians being persecuted around the world, Jesus is still taking it personal, saying, why are you persecuting me? When you're putting those in prison, harming them, it's the same as if it's being done to Jesus. Another thing I notice about Paul is that he, along with all the Pharisees, they were convinced that they were on the right side of the fight, but they were on the wrong side. And they were pursuing that with so much passion, but they were wrong and they were deceived. And I still see that Today, the people about when it comes to religion or other thing, they get so up in arms and they'll just fight to the death over something. And so many times they're actually wrong about what they're fighting about. And that was Paul. He would have fought this to the death. He would have, I believe he would have given his life for this cause. He was so passionate about it, but he was so wrong at the same time. And it took the light of the gospel to open his eyes and to see clearly for the first time. Another interesting point is in Acts chapter 26, when Paul is retelling this story, he, he gives us a bit of information that's left out here in Acts chapter 9. And he tells us something that Jesus said to him. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And a goad was like a sharp stick that farmers, shepherds would use to prod cattle or you know sheep or goats, basically when they were being stubborn and they didn't want to obey the orders, you know, they would, they would stick them with that stick. And for an ox, in particular, that when that goad was behind him, if he kicked against it, he would kick into that sharp stick. So uh, it was very painful and it was futile. And that's the point of what Jesus was saying here. 
Why are you kicking against the goad? Why are you kicking against that sharp stick? So what that tells me, Jesus is telling us that something was going on in Paul's heart, that he knew it wasn't right, and it was akin to him kicking against a goad. In other words, something was prodding him saying, this is not right what you're doing. This, you're not going the right direction. You're on the wrong side of the fight. But he kept kicking against that, and he kept fighting against that because he was so convinced that he was right, and he was just ignoring his conscience. But that one statement from Jesus tells us that he had an inclination in his heart that he was on the wrong side of the fight, and he was being convicted about it, and it was bothering him, but he just was overriding it and continuing to press on and persecute the church. So after Saul sees the light, um, they lead him into Damascus, and in verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done in your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So everybody's scared of Paul. Nobody wants to help Paul, even Ananias, godly man, good man. But his first argument to the Lord is, wait a minute, I've heard about this guy. This guy is destroying Christians everywhere, and the reason he's in Damascus is to harm Christians. And now you're telling me to go help him. So he was afraid, and rightfully so. From this vision that Ananias had, we get the first insight into the calling that was on Paul's life. Because he says to him, he shall carry my name before the Gentiles before kings and before the children of Israel. And he also says that he will suffer much for the name of Christ. So we, we get our first glimpse into the, the call that Paul had on his life, that he was, number one, going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Now remember, that was a foreign concept at this point, the gospel being brought to the Gentiles. But Jesus tells Ananias right here that that was one of Paul's primary callings was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And then also he would bring it before kings. We know he did that. He stood before, we knew he was going to stand before Caesar, King Agrippa, some of the other kings. He had that place and that call to stand before those in authority and bring the gospel. And then we know how much he suffered for the gospel, the pain and the suffering that he went through. So all these things ended up happening in Paul's life. Verse 17, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there's a few interesting points here. First of all, Ananias refers to Saul as brother. No one in the scriptures referred to as brother unless they are a brother in Christ. He's referring to him as someone who's been saved and given their life to Jesus. So Saul has had the Damascus Road experience. He's been radically saved. He is already a follower of Christ at this point. Ananias calls him brother, and he tells him why he came. He said, I came, number one, for you to regain your sight, and number two, for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice that Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit is a separate event from him being saved on the Damascus Road. He's already been radically saved, but this is days later now, and Ananias is saying, I'm going to lay my hands on you and pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which happens in the next few verses. So Ananias prays for Paul. He regains his sight. The Bible says something like scales fell off of his eyes. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Now that's a key point because when it says disciples here, notice it does not say apostles. And that's because Paul did not meet the apostles until about three years after this. So when it says that he was with the disciples, it's not talking about the 12 disciples. It's talking about all the disciples, followers of God that were in Damascus at that time. 
and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now, remember, Paul's education and understanding of the, of the Scriptures was very vast. We talked about a couple weeks ago his great heritage and pedigree as a Pharisee and a student of Gamaliel. Well, now all that's being put to use because he, he studied the Scriptures meticulously. And so now with the light of the gospel that's coming in and the fact that he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, for the first time he is seeing all those scriptures that he studied, all those scriptures that he memorized, all the study that he's had. He's, he's now seeing all of that through the lens and the light of the gospel. So whereas before it was just kind of information, now it's revelation and the Holy Spirit is putting that, that bit of revelation on it and his eyes are just being opened. So he's not like someone newly saved where they don't really know a lot and they've got to be taught everything. He's been taught all of this his whole life, the scripture. It's just now coming with a different spin. It has the light of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit on it. So all that information he received is all of a sudden shown in the correct light. And it's just like a light bulb that's gone off in his mind. So it says immediately he started teaching in the synagogue. He's only been saved like a week. He's immediately teaching in the synagogue. And the Bible says proving that Jesus was the Christ. So he is immediately taking that information and all the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies. And he's creating this whole argument for the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. He's arguing with the leaders in the synagogue, preaching and convincing them that Jesus was the Son of God. So this former person who is using all this information to fight against Jesus, all that same upbringing, training, and scripture is now being used to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. It's all been turned around. Not only was Paul's great mind that he had now working for the kingdom of God, but the same passion and zeal, that same passion that drove him to stone Stephen and persecute the church and throw people in prison, now he's got that same passion. You know, he doesn't get saved and, and, and go sit for years now. He immediately starts working. He immediately starts preaching. He immediately starts going on missionary journeys. He even immediately starts training disciples, which we're going to see in just a moment here. So all that same fury and passion is now working for the kingdom of God. You can imagine that, that Satan was upset because this, this one who was working against God is now working for him with that same passion and energy. Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. That seems to be their, their only solution to people that oppose them is, is kill them because you know they're arguing with Paul and he's defeating them one argument after another and they're like, well, let's just kill him. That's the only thing we know to do. They did the same thing with Jesus. Steve, it just That's their mode of operation. When we can't defeat them or prove that they're wrong, just kill them. So that's now they're playing with Paul. So they're watching the gates night and day, the Bible says, in order to kill him. But his disciples, notice it says his disciples, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So this is only a few maybe months after Paul has been saved. He's already got disciples. He's already got people that he's training. Because of this plot, they lower him down over a, over a wall through a basket. And uh, I've always liked this story because you never find out the names of his disciples. You know, here they are mentioned in Scripture, but you don't know their names. Um, but yet they had such an important task of lowering Paul down over the side of a wall. They'll never be mentioned, they'll never be known, but yet they were protecting and preserving Paul and all that he would do in the future, including writing two-thirds of the New Testament, literally being lowered down in that basket right there. So Paul flees Damascus and he goes to Jerusalem, verse 26. When he had come to Jerusalem... He attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, 
And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So there's a lot going on in this passage here. Number one, Paul again tries to connect with the disciples and they're afraid of him. They No one trusts him yet. You know, they're like, this is just... It's just so hard for everybody to believe that he's had this radical of a transformation. But the other thing that uh, that we see here is Paul meets a man named Barnabas. And this is such a cool story to me because while people are rejecting Paul and scared of Paul, don't really know how to take Paul, it's one of those things that's almost like, it could be God, but I'm going to just kind of keep my distance. You find Barnabas coming here and saying, no, I believe in this man. I see something in him and I want to be a part of the call of God on his life. I want to join myself to him and, and help him. And Paul and Barnabas formed this relationship where God uses both of them to accomplish you know, the call of God that's on Paul's life. And it's an, it's an amazing story what happens here. Now we're first introduced to Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. And when, it, when the scripture introduced him, it says that his name was actually Joseph but that the apostles nicknamed him or renamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And that's how he becomes known throughout the rest of Scripture. So his name is Joseph, but they renamed him because of his this unique gift that he had, and they called him son of encouragement because he was probably all, always encouraging other people. And, and you see that here. And I've met people like Barnabas that they have no self-interest like no, you know, wrong motives, but when they see a gift or a calling on someone else, they just want to promote them, help them, make sure they fulfill the call of God, and there's no ulterior motive, and that was that was Barnabas. And you, you see that because the apostles recognized it on him, and they renamed him Son of Encouragement. So he's probably the one where if everybody's in a room and and somebody's talking about someone and, and, and it's obvious that this person was at fault and everybody's kind of picking apart their faults, he's going to be the guy to speak up and go, yeah, but you know, he just, he's something good about him. You know, he's got a good heart. He's going to come from that other angle and bring that level of encouragement. And that's what you see right here with Paul. When Paul couldn't really find where he fit, he couldn't really find his place. He's having to run from city to city because people are killing him. Uh, people are afraid of him. He doesn't really have a place to land. Barnabas, who had a a strong relationship with the apostles comes in and takes him under his wing, not as a disciple or anything like that. If anything, Paul, Barnabas was probably under Paul as far as education and knowledge goes, but he came in and helped him and supported him in a moment where Paul was very vulnerable, and they begin to work together from there forward. So this rocky start that Paul had in the beginning with the disciples and the apostles and people not trusting him and all of that, it's interesting because it, it kind of carries out through the remainder of the New Testament. He never really is completely accepted by the disciples or the apostles. And uh, we're going to see that as we cont continue our study on Paul the Apostle next week.